Rochester approach, experimental 707, Mike, Mike. Out of 22,000 feet, catastrophic exploded engine failure, gliding to uh, your field. It's physics, math, and engineering. Machine it, draft it, build it, test it, break it. Every time something new gets built, the entire world advances. Laying in bed at night, it's designing new parts, designing new suspension, designing new wings. Legacy 707, Mike, Mike, Rochester, Spurge, Rochester, 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 and uh, wind at Roch three, uh, correction, three, three zero at one three is the wind. Uh, visibility is one zero. Sky condition four thousand one hundred scattered. Ceiling five thousand broken. Six thousand broken. Temperature two three. Dew point one four. Altimeter three zero zero three. You can expect the visual approach to runway three one. Runway three one is shortened with a displaced threshold for the first thousand feet of the approach into the runway. Roger that. Mike, Mike, we'll make the attempt for runway 3-1. Well, guys, it started out as a really exciting, fun day going to Oshkosh to see everyone who loves aviation and every cool new aviation gadget. Um, beautiful day, beautiful weather, plan a diversion to the north to go around sales, stay, for the most part, VFR most of the day. Um, that's certainly not how it ended, so I'm now sitting in a hotel, parts are everywhere, um, holes out the plane, holes in the wing, shrapnel, uh, brushing the leading edges of the wing and the tail with pieces of metal in it. Um, I tell you what, this engine didn't talk to me. Normally, if engines are not doing well they whisper quiet little things <laughs> temperatures pressures um, power vibration this one was just a silent ticking clock so uh have time to just relax it's been several hours get to a hotel room Call my family, tell them I love them, and uh, just kind of think it through a bit. So, Rochester folks, seven Mike Mike, just checking back with you, fifteen thousand feet uh, on the glide inbound. Legacy seven Mike Mike Roger, flighting one three zero will be a vector for left downwind. Roger that one three zero seven Mike Mike, and. Uh, I would like to circle the field, so keep me tight if you would. I have one shot at this. Thanks, 7 Mike Mike. Legacy 7 Mike Mike, Roger. I tell you what, probably the thing that, besides the giant explosion, <laughs> I told someone on the ground it sounded like I, I hit a deer filled with TNT. Um, it was just a loud, violent bang. And, uh, of course, I was doing, at the time, 411 knots, and uh, the engine didn't slow down. It just stopped at 30,000 RPM to zero in a fraction of a second. Um, parts exploded out everywhere. Um, when you go from 411 knots with the kind of power it takes to hold you at that speed, and then autopilot on, smooth sailing, crisp air above the cloud layer, and then zero. <laughs> that's, that's a heck of a yaw. And uh, it's startling. Currently over a thick cloud layer, so I'm gonna orbit down through the clouds um, with you here, that my mind. Legacy 7 Mike, Mike, Roger. And uh, left or right turn, whichever works out better for you, it's approved. Thanks for that. Making left turns. Here's zero Fox track. Go turn left thing one zero zero. Be a vector for uh, traffic that's uh, trying to come in the field with, uh, uh, without an engine here. And uh, zero Fox echo uh, left turn to a one zero zero. What made it worse is while I'm trying to grasp what just happened, um, the cabin filled with smoke and the windshield covered in oil. Um, 
That smoke is scarier than knowing the engine just quit right then. Uh, what was going through my mind is, well, certainly not am I gonna try and restart this thing. <laughs> there was no question it was done. It was absolutely done. Um, you know, shrapnel shooting out into the edges of the wing and tail <laughs> is a sign. Smoke is a sign. The loud bang is a sign. And the prop stopping is a sign. It's not going to restart. But I started thinking about a fire. So instantly what's going through my mind is I need a runway. And I need a long runway. <laughs> this plane is a racer not be able to land on a dirt field. My approach speed is 140 knots indicated. My over the fence speed is 120 knots indicated. And I need to get out of the mid flight levels to the ground before whatever is making the smoke becomes a fire or is already a fire and is going to become a bigger fire. Mike, Mike's now IMC, and just a standard rate turn over the field with you. All those simulated engine outs, all those what if it died here, what if my engine quit there, whatever that you've trained over and over and over, do it, do it again. All right, field's in sight, seven Mike, Mike. Be ready. Um, and certainly don't kid yourself that it may not happen. Like seven Mike Mike, Roger, clear visual approach on my three one. Clear visual three one, seven Mike Mike. Or will never happen to you. And uh, Tower, I'm going to uh, shoot for three one, but these turns might not work out. So if I could have all runways cleared for any direction, if needed, to take a non headwind landing. Legacy 7 Mike Mike. Uh, any runway you can make will work fine for us. Wind is 32014. The reality is it probably will never happen to you. That's the likelihood. Be ready. That's all I'm going to say. All right, here's coming down. We're going to shoot for 3 1 7 Mike Mike. Legacy 7 Mike Mike. And I'm just going to have you stay my frequency. You don't have to deal with that. Thank you. It is unlikely it's never going to happen. But be prepared. Train, practice, I'm gonna step up my game. I wanna be more focused on safety in every aspect of flying. Tower from Rescue 5, do you have an aircraft type and souls on board and fuel? And when things are calm, at a very professional and appropriate time, ATC was amazing, so thank you guys. That phrase comes up that you never wanna hear. How many souls on board? You know, I really wanted to say one. Uh, having that happen and having someone else in the plane, my heart sank. Because it's real. When you got one of your very best friends sitting next to you, and they ask that question, and you have to say two, or four, or 10, or 50, you're a commercial pilot. Yeah, it gets real. And you should be ready for it and know that you did everything you can to train and practice for that question, if it ever comes. May it never. How many souls on board? That makes you think. And uh, I only thought about it for a moment, but it definitely was a momentary distraction. That person next to me is one of my best friends and I talk to him every day. And uh, Josh builds airplanes with me and makes videos and goes mountain biking and riding and scooters. <laughs> and he's sitting next to me and you hear that question and that's tough. And yeah, center, so Mike Mike down on the ground, clear of the runways onto the taxiway. Thanks for your calm voice. And we are safe on the ground. Uh, doesn't appear to be a fire. We have a little visibility out of the window, but appreciate your help. Thanks. Mike, that's great. Great to hear. Glad to hear you're safe. 
Good job. Congratulations, Mike. Mike. Good job. Thank you, guys. Well, guys, not the way I wanted to start Oshkosh, but I'm here. I get to go home to my family, and I'm still going to Oshkosh to see all my family of aviators. So we all know we practice for this, and you just never really know when it's gonna get you. Today, I had an engine failure. Catastrophic, I just got the plane in the hangar. So um, it feels weird to record this right now, but I'd rather just record it while I'm standing by the plane and tell you the emotions I'm feeling, kind of what went through my head as we're flying along. One of the greatest, most reliable engines of all time, highest safety record, period. Yet things still go bad. This engine is uh, an engine approaching near its time to overhaul. However, a lot of aircraft, even certified that this plane came out of a Dash 42, they'll put it on what's called the MORE program and go several thousand more hours. This plane's been purring like a kitten, absolutely running like a dream. All the tests, all the checks have been perfect. It just came out of annual. I'm sure this has nothing to do with that. Uh, but we did everything, oil changes and screen checks, filter checks, everything that can be done. And I hired a mechanic that specifically just does turbine engines to have another set of eyes do all of that to make sure it's good. And I am completely confident it has nothing to do with him. I wonder if there's something that this engine has in its history that never made the logs. Maybe a pilot that didn't know how to start up a aircraft like a, a King Air, like it came out of, um, with dead batteries. And maybe it's been hot started and it had internal problems, maybe ingested sand, maybe it was in the desert. I don't know. It's the only thing I can figure right now because these engines just don't fail like this one did. 27,000 feet on the way to Oshkosh. I think I was 30, 40 minutes out, um, setting up for the approach, everything loaded and uh, no warning. Pressures, temperatures, fuel, flow, speeds. You would expect even a speed to drop off if something catastrophic was happening. Turbine engines usually don't just quit. They give you a lot of warning. And I mean, not a lot of warning like 10 minutes. They give you like months of warning of this slow trend. And uh, I experienced one of the most rare things that ever happens with a PT-6. It sounded like I hit a deer going 400 knots, which is what I was doing. I think I was doing 411 knots. And it was one giant instantaneous explosion. Just boom. I mean, it was loud. And the plane just got peppered with chunks of metal. This is a catastrophic failure of a turbine engine I can honestly say I have never, ever heard of happening. And that's oil. And in there is a puddle this big inside there, this close to a hot lead and a ground lead of 24 volts of power that was shot out with a shotgun, basically. So, we're here, <laughs> we're on the ground. I need to get a new engine. I, guys, I gotta tell you, I think I'm gonna, I've been doing a lot of racing, and a lot of stuff. I think I wanna focus maybe a little more on aviation on the safety side. Maybe I should do a video about proper care and startup of turbine engines, because I, have personally watched people start their engines wrong, tell me, oh, it's fine, I do it that way all the time. And I cringe and I get sick because I know what's happening when they start wrong or they introduce fuel when the N1's too low and those burners are just cooking the can and they think they're fine. These engines should go for 10,000 hours, no effort. They're set to go 3,600 hours because they know guys like us go out and fly them and guys like us make mistakes and sometimes we hot start them. Um, I can honestly say I've never hot started an engine, 
but I can see how it happens when you got a low battery. If you're not paying attention, you don't shut it down, you will. Maybe this had a series of bad hot starts, maybe it had a bad history. Uh, it's not Pratt & Whitney, I think it's owner operator from possibly 20 years ago. It's an old engine. I love you guys, be safe, be cautious, take care of your motors, take care of your planes. Don't shortcut. The front of the wings are hit so hard that it's gouged into the carbon all the way back to the tail. And I just repainted this plane for Oshkosh. So it's not bugs, rock chips, or rain at 400 knots. Um, I've got metal chunks that hit the tail, the wings, everything. So when that happened, it was just instant freeze for one second. I knew the engine was gone. There was no question. That prop already just stopped. And I instantly keyed up. I said, I'm declaring an emergency. I've got a catastrophic engine failure and I'm on my way to an airport. I need an airport. Guys were great, helped me out. I started asking about what's the nearest airport, give me a heading. I started turning one direction just because naturally on the Garmin screen, which I love about Garmin, it shows all the big airports. And at 27,000 feet, I can make it about anywhere. So I started turning and going, okay, I see a big airport area this way. And, and then ATC was pointing out another airport. Quite frankly, about the time he was talking, my mind moved into something totally different. So I probably asked repeat, double check questions quite a bit. But what started going through my mind is, okay, is there a fire? How fast do I need to get down? Could a fire start? How close is my airport? And now it literally just went to math mode. Um, a lot of great features on the Garmin screens showing me how far I can glide. I had plenty <laughs> of distance. So I wasn't worried about trying to pitch for best glide of 120. I was going, I'm at 27,000 feet and my batteries are gonna die. That was what was going through my mind. I gotta tell you, um, I gotta shout out, shout, out, shout out to a couple of great companies. Garmin, you freaking made a product that just takes care of so much workload in a critical moment. It was unbelievable. And I gotta tell you one specifically was going through my mind for 20 minutes probably, I don't know how long that landing was, but um, I had just put a brand new set during the annual of EarthX batteries, two of their jumbos. And in my mind, I literally was thought, electrical system, shut down, shut down, shut down, both for fire, for the, the, the oil was everywhere. I didn't know if there was fuel in that, the smoke we had. And in my mind, I was like, okay, now I gotta, I gotta maybe shoot an approach or circle through the clouds, which is what we ended up doing. And I need these batteries to last long enough to keep my radios going, avionics up, GPS alive, um, potentially an approach, and then still run my landing gear. And um, I shut all the systems off and the whole way down, I'm just watching the bolts. What's my bolts? And um, guys, you, Garmin, they'll tell you right where your bolts, where your screens will go off. You know where it is. And in my old school lead acid batteries, I would not have got down. I, I, don't, I don't think my batteries, I mean, we might have got down. We're gonna get down no matter what. <laughs> Let's be clear. Gravity is gonna get us there. Um, I don't know that the batteries would have made it that long. And um, the thing I was really worried about is, am I gonna have radios and gear and everything when I get on the way there and gotta go through the cloud layers? Um, and the, I, I mean, I got down and we had battery to spare. The voltage almost didn't even drop. So I'm running big high output radios and talking to everyone. And, my voltage was almost still topped 20 minutes later. So while ATC has given me some uh, helpful advice, I'm doing shutdowns, shutting off lights, shutting off my fuel pumps. I think fuel pumps is where I went first. I was like, if my avionics die, I don't have someone to talk to. If my, if my batteries go dead, I lose my avionics, but I also lose my gear. It's electric, hydraulic. And the gear extension has an emergency system that Turbulence has, but you don't always count on it. Sometimes they don't want to swing or you don't get them all. So I didn't want to lose that. So I started shutting down systems 
The first one I went to was fuel pumps. Several reasons. One, I wanted to shut the fuel off. That engine's done. I, it was, there was no, not even one second thought to go, do I try and restart this? Like I was like, declare an emergency. My engine's gone. I'm heading down to land. Where's an airport? I mean, that's all I could think in my mind. There was no restart procedure, this, that, the other. Did I run out of gas in the tank? Like something silly. No, this thing was purring like a kitten, tons of fuel, and it exploded. So it just gave up. So I started shutting everything down and aiming for an airport. And uh, we're VMC on top. So there was a cloud layer underneath us, uh, IFR flight plan up in the flight levels. And uh, I start heading for an airport, asking for runway lengths, what's the runway elevation, the things I need, because I'm a numbers guy. And all I want to know is, how many feet to the ground? What's my descent rate gonna be? How many times am I gonna be able to circle? And how quickly can I get down safely in case some fire starts up? Because this explosion was an explosion. Like I didn't know if there was some smoldering little something in the engine. So fuel off and get me on the ground. Worked out great. ATC was amazing. ATC, all of you on there, switching me off, handing me off. Thank you for the support. Calm voices, clear direction. You guys are awesome. I'm sure you've saved a lot of pilots' lives with that calm, professional, direct, concise answers. And just given the options that I have and then letting me pick from those options. So I selected the biggest airport with the biggest runway. Happened to be an international airport. Honestly, I don't even know where I am right now. <laughs> I'll look it up. But uh, somewhere not too far west of Oshkosh. Well, it's probably a long ways from Oshkosh. I was doing 400 knots, so a couple hundred miles from Oshkosh, I'm sure. Um, and, uh, and then I was just worried about how many runways, what, what direction is the wind. I definitely wanted to take the headwind landing, even though I had a big runway. Uh, I knew that I want to land a little bit longer. You don't want to come short in a plane that's going to touch down at 120 knots. <laughs> the touchdown speed of turbulence, it's a racer. It lands faster than most planes fly at top speed that you learn to fly in. So um, it's like going full throttle at the ground. You don't want to land short. And so that was the goal. How do I get the headwind and how do I get um, about a quarter of the way down the runway and come to a stop? Um, as I was approaching, I felt really good I could get there, but in my mind, I thought, here's these other great big long runway going the other way. Last thing I need is someone on that runway, and everyone's professional. They already had it cleared, but in my mind, it's a double check. I knew if I was changing up runways and going to need to land a 13 knot plus gusting crosswind on a shorter runway, um, it would be a last second choice. Last thing I need is a, a plane parked on it or near it. So um, of course their response was, it was our, good to go. All runways were mine in any direction. So that was calming, just helped set the stage. Came into final, um, everything shut down. I could on uh, the systems, except for keep my radios and my instruments up, watch my airspeeds. Once I knew I was plenty high, plenty hot, but could visually see I could get my target, I sent the gear first, even though typically I'll put in 10 notches of flaps slow and then get the gear. I want to just leave my lap, flaps as my final fine tuning. So I waited, got slowed down enough to get my gear out and then see, okay, what do I need for a slip? Um, I was coming downwind and then making a left base, just a continuous turn left base to final as I was pacing the wind. That headwind, uh, two things um, that was in my mind is this aircraft, if the engine's running, you may go to idle. You think you've done simulated engine outs um, and that it's going to be the same. You need to keep in mind it's not. And I've done a lot of practice with various aircraft and all of you are doing the same. Um, the, that practice and that training you're doing pays off. But when you pull an aircraft to idle that is still running, depending on what engine, it still produces thrust. On some piston engines, it's actually 
turning the blade slow enough that it's creating drag like a giant circular disc where an engine off, if the prop actually stopped, some might windmill, um, you might get a better glide. So you need to kind of know. Um, I knew that this engine, because of where the flight idle power is when I go to flight idle on the turbine, that this would still be producing a lot of forward thrust. And with the engine off, I'm going to have a fraction of that simulated engine out that I've done lots of training in this aircraft in. So I wanted to stay extra high. I threw out the gear. Everything was looking good. Um, I wanted to make sure that my approach was going to be a slip. So that was the plan. Be high, never short. I turned in and I started to move the flaps and I just paused as I was making that inbound turn because I instantly could feel that wind, what was a 13 knot tailwind coming downwind to a 13 knot headwind. As soon as I felt that drift push, I left the flaps, tightened up the turn and, and pointed at the runway tighter um, and then used my flaps to finesse it down. And once I got where I knew I was assured made, I used slip, final it out and rolled it out and hit about, I don't know, 20, I don't know what it was, maybe 1, 1,500 feet down the runway of a 13 thousand foot long runway. It might have been 2,000, I don't know, but felt like about a quarter of the way down, stopped somewhere around midfield. Um, thank you, the rescue personnel. It was great. Um, I had asked if they could, uh, I remember asking ATC if they could have rescue personnel ready, um, just anticipating maybe I won't make that runway. I'd rather have a bunch of fire trucks lined up and guys with gear on coming out to me short in a ball of fire at the end in a ball of fire and hopefully not either. But um, I remember asking ATC, could you have them get the rescue personnel ready? Like in my mind, this, <laughs> this isn't a simulation. We got one shot and his voice was, I don't remember what he said, but it was calm, direct, professional. They've already been advised or they're already there or something. Um, I knew that the rescue carts were on the roll or already waiting for me. So, um, that just took one more la layer of concern off my mind. And then it was just fly the plane, go for it, and stick the landing. So uh, that's what we did. I think when you're hyper-focused, it makes it easy to grease it. So we just kind of greased it in. Um, right as I was landing and I had it made, I think I turned to Josh, who was with me, who was absolutely the best co-pilot. Quiet, calm, pulled up airports, looking at the glide path, asked if I needed anything and that he would sit and be there if I need it. So thank you, Josh, for being a great, great, calm, professional, helpful co-pilot because that just made it great. I can't imagine if I had the opposite. Are we going to die? Maybe. Psh, stop talking. <laughs> Maybe if you keep talking. So uh, everybody, ATC, the tower, the rescue team was great. Uh, just kept my speed up and aimed for the taxiway so I could get clear and make sure the runways got going. We got off, circled off the, the clearing and all the way out onto a taxiway. Airport planes started taking back off. It's a commercial airport, so there were airlines waiting on me. Oh, also, thank you all you uh, airline pilots and crew and everybody that followed me on my declared emergency to the ground. It felt good to clear the runway for obvious reasons. I'm gonna go home to my family, but also just our family of fellow aviators. All the pilots in the air, the captains holding short, the airliners all waiting for this knucklehead to find his way down through uh, the clouds, which I don't know if I even mentioned, had to go through some IMCs. Anyway, everybody, the fellow pilots, everyone holding short. Everyone keyed up the mics and said, congratulations, good job, nice work, nice landing. And, and that looked like a great landing and just whatever they all said, it was just mic after mic, congratulations, good job, welcome back. Um, we have a great family of aviators. We have a great family of uh, pilots, air traffic control, towers. Everybody out there wants to see you succeed. They want to see you make it. They want to be there for you. They want to help you. It's a family. I'm so happy to be part of it. Love you guys. I got to find an engine. 
then back to work. And go hug my family. Go hug your family. Tell them you love them. See you soon. All right, guys. So this is the kind of stuff that I have been dying to know. Turbulence's engine exploded yesterday. And I caught a commercial flight home. And Garmin is awesome. They have the ability to put in a chip, which I always leave in my aircraft to see trends and monitor the engine. So I pulled the chip and it did exactly what it's supposed to. And it gives me every flight, every second, it puts up a tick and shows me anything I want to know. Where I was on the GPS, what's my ground speed, what's airspeed, density altitude. Every number that your Garmin is displaying is put into this simple format where it just lines them all up. You can select them and read through them. So this is what we've been doing for the last little bit is just going through to see, did I miss a trend? Like, was there a telltale sign that was saying something's about to go? And um, as far as flight, turbulence is a, a clean airframe. It's smooth as silk. Yeah, we were doing 411 knots ground speed. Uh, turbulence was probably flying close to 365 knots, um, true airspeed, summer and uh, heavy with fuel, it can go 385 winter and light. Um, so everything was right in line with what we expect this time of year. Temperatures are perfect. Um, and I was telling someone at the airport, you know, what happened after I landed and they're like, oh, your racer? Oh man, that engine has probably been run hard and hot. And I thought to myself, I said, actually, I didn't even have to think about it. No, that's the purpose of turbulence when I built it was, how do I build the fastest turbo prop in the world? <laughs> By putting the right engine and airframe together so that it runs part 135 book temperature specs if it were in a 135 King Air charter airplane, which is what this air engine came out of. This engine, normally when I fly it, to save fuel, I can save eight gallons an hour flying it at, uh, slowing it way down to 350 knots true airspeed. So normally this plane flies at 350 knots, at 711 degrees, 710 to 720 ITT. Um, I was flying out to Oshkosh, and I was running closer to normal King Air temps, which was uh, upper mid 700s. And I pulled it up to see, kind of was the temperatures moving and I can see it right here. Absolutely, and we went back for hours. None, there was no variance of any kind. This thing went from full temperature and in one second, so when I say an explosion, everything went at once off you come right here scroll over look at n1 my n1 right where it should be 98 and here you got three seconds one two three seconds from the explosion 92 69 53 well that engine stopped immediately when it exploded but the prop free will down for a few seconds. So three seconds kind of spooling down. That leads me to believe what I was wondering if maybe the gearbox blew up when I first looked at the plane and found pieces of metal under the gearbox. Um, they must have just shot forward with the explosion out of the side of the can is my guess. Um, but there was metal under the gearbox. Made me think maybe the gearbox gave up, blew some metal out from underneath it, seized the shaft and then blew out all the blades that ejected off a stop shaft um, from my PT1, PT2 blades of the hot section of the engine. Seeing that the prop spooled down and that I could still move it, um, I don't think the gearbox was the problem at all. Just me throwing out every crazy idea. Um, and then I also thought could it have been the compressor section? Um, definitely wasn't that because then I got a closer look at the PT blades. PT1 was all the blades were there, but they were beat up from the PT2 blades. All the PT2 blades are missing. And they beat up the PT1 blades 
um, that's, that are about that far apart on their way coming apart. Um, which my point is that the PT2 blades are the closest to the exhaust pipe downstream or upstream, I guess is the right way to call it, uh, is the PT1 blades. And then down further, the first thing the air comes in is your compressor section, so your T CTs. The CTs, if they came apart, they would have destroyed the PT1 and the PT2. But since my PT1 blades are not destroyed and my PT2 blades are gone, I'm going to give it an over 90%. We'll find out. We're going to send the engine to Pratt & Whitney. I'm going to give it over 90% chance that the PT2 blades in the hot section, one of them are, came off and bound up and wiped out all the rest and just 30,000 RPM, it's just gonna go and molten metal shot out of that airframe. So we found pieces of those PT blades. I've got one in my pocket. <laughs> it is turned into a, like a round wire and curled up. So they just exploded and went through, at least I think it's a PT blade. It's about the right length, but it looks like a molten bomb hit it. So. Um, anyway, so all the numbers, oil pressures, perfect, S right in the middle of the green. Oil temperature, spot on. Turbulence has always just been perfect. So um, turbulence has got like a thousand hours, built it five years ago, the airframe itself. It's been just the most reliable, perfect airplane. Um, my just cross country commuter that happens to do 365 to 385 knots true. Here's the big change. Um, my business partner is a great guy. A lot of time flies twin turbines. Um, he had a, a day he regrets. He feels horrible. We can all do it. And he hot started, not this motor, the motor that was in it just before this. And uh, we weren't gonna fly a hot started motor. So that motor came out and was either gonna be used for parts, overhauled, take care of whatever happened during the hot start, and then put back in another plane. But we didn't wanna wait while that engine was being worked on for turbulence. And I have another project <laughs> I wanted another Dash 42 motor for. So the motor that just blew up went in five hours I had five hours of flight on it, um, and we went out on this trip and gave up. So we took a good look at the logs. The logs were good. Um, we got this motor from Pratt & Whitney. They're a great company. The engine had good times. The engine is coming close to a, an overhaul if you didn't want to put it on a more program, but still had several hundred hours before it would even be. You, have, you can go 400 hours over on just a 135 ticket for charter, this engine was close to overhaul, could go another 400 hours, plus if you trend monitor it, you can go even on a certified airplane part 95, you can go several thousand more hours and a lot of people do. They'll take them to six, seven, eight thousand hours, which means this engine had thousands of hours to go. And it was experimental, you could go beyond that. I wouldn't. I, I like to fly the engine by the book, by the temps, period. It's a race plane that can go fast because of the motor and the package, not because of racing it like a Reno racer or one of my past racers where you boost it and give it all it's got and know you might hurt it. This, was, this is not that plane. Um, so five hours on the, on the motor, not one sign of anything to come. The temps didn't move, ITT pressures, N1, N2, no vibration, no anything. There was just before the bang, there was just the start of a little tiny vibration, like just enough I almost had time to say, did you feel anything? Like it was just like the tiny, one of the ones, you, if you're flying at night, you think you hear it over and over and over again, like, is that something or not something? Um, it was just a fraction of a second of, is that something? And then boom, that was the warning. The Garmin card shows everything. 411 knots over the ground. Temps, I, there was no, for, there was no forecast. 
This was, this was uh, 411 knots to zero thrust, full hard yaw, loud bang, smoke. Um, <laughs> it was not ready. It was smooth as silk flight. Uh, that's one way to wake you up. So um, all the flights that I have recorded, which is just since this motor went in, um, are perfect. Start to stop, start up, shut down, temperatures, perfect. Nice ice cold starts. So I don't know. I think the bottom line is be ready for anything. Um, I still am digging to go, is there something more I could have done? And all I can think is buy a brand new motor, but a million dollar motor for a plane when a engine that can go thousands of hours more just doesn't make sense. Um, certified, maintained, I don't know. Be ready, go train, practice, be prepared. Um, I think I'm one of a very, very, very small handful of people that have actually had a full grenaded catastrophic failure of a PT6 engine. Um, five hours on this airplane engine in this airframe and they were all a good, beautiful five hours till they weren't. So guys, I don't know, be safe. Love you guys. Get back to work. <laughs>